this season of Kenobi coming to a close, it's time to stop and rank all 14 live action Star Wars movies and TV shows from the worst to the best. Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN. In real life, everyone understands that security matters. When you leave your house, you lock the door so no one can steal your stuff. But when it comes to your online life, security still matters because websites and hackers are constantly trying to collect your data and invade your privacy. That's why you need NordVPN. A VPN secures your data by encrypting it and routing it through a remote server. NordVPN makes it so your online data is unreadable to others. But here's the cool part for movie lovers. Streaming services like Netflix and Disney Plus have different movies available in different countries. With NordVPN, you can choose which country you're accessing the internet from with just one click of a button, so you can access the Netflix library that's available in different countries. Get NordVPN's exclusive cybersecurity package and secure your data, passwords, and files. Go to nordvpn.com slash Sean Chandler to get a two-year plan with a huge discount plus one additional month for free. And to top it all off, they have a 30-day money-back gift guarantee. If you're interested, the link is down below in the description and let's get started. Coming in in last place, The Last Jedi, easily the most polarizing Star Wars film. Some of you see this placement and think, thank you. But the other half of you are thinking, amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. To me, this is a movie that when I first saw it, I wasn't really sure what I thought about it. And as time has passed, I only like it less and less and less and feel like it simply does not belong as part of the main line of Star Wars stories, primarily because Ryan Johnson doesn't seem interested in celebrating the sort of things that Star Wars has popularized. He wants to deconstruct them. So we're deconstructing the Jedi. We're criticizing Poe for being kind of the rogue hero rather than celebrating that, which is what Star Wars has always kind of done. And so just put a bad taste in my mouth that has only gotten worse as it's aged. From there, a bunch of people want to say like, people don't like this movie because it's so different. But at its core, it's structurally kind of a remake of Empire Strikes Back where the Resistance is on the run from the First Who are Order who are striking back. Our new Force-sensitive person is training off with a reclusive Jedi person and then they just kind of throw in the throne room scene from Return of the Jedi to change things up a bit. And likewise, it's a movie that seems to actively dislike everything that was set up in The Force Awakens. So Snoke, hmm, nope, that's nothing. That doesn't mean anything. Cut his legs off. Do something totally different with that. So a movie that has some gorgeous shots, a few sequences that are kind of cool. But as a Star Wars movie, it seems like it has a totally different interpretation of what Star Wars is than I have, in which case it just takes the Luke Skywalker character and does stuff with him that I simply don't think makes any sense whatsoever. And even to the extent that they try to explain it and defend it, a few flashbacks can't get me to where this movie puts that character. So this is easily my least favorite at this point in time. Number 13, Rise of Skywalker. After the polarizing reception to The Last Jedi, they went into full-blown course correction mode and cobbled together this conclusion to the Skywalker saga that involves bringing back Palpatine and introducing him by saying that basically he started a podcast. Not a great plan. And then from there, it's a story just duct taped together with coincidences and contrivances just to kind of force a series of things to happen where everyone's related to everyone else. Everyone shows back up. Nothing is set up properly. Everything just kind of comes together. And as the conclusion to the Skywalker saga, it was unbelievably undercooked and underdeveloped and forced to just kind of fit into its mold. I mean, this movie is just jam packed with things that just make absolutely no sense. Like it starts off with Palpatine just raising up thousands of Star Destroyers out of nowhere. 
So like on a story level, on a like coherence level, Last Jedi probably makes more sense. This movie at least is trying to tell a Star Wars story and celebrate the things that Star Wars is known for. So I find it more watchable and significantly less off-putting. But as the movie they promoted is the conclusion I just can't fathom how a company with all the resources that Disney had made such like a cobbled together mess of a story to close out something that they know meant so much to so many different people and where they did things so lazy as to just like this late into the game invent new force powers in particular the power to bring people back from the dead something that if you've seen the previous eight episodes could have been really useful for a whole bunch of other characters in the mix but no let's just throw it at the end so we can have like a surprise way to have kylo ren redeem himself by literally giving his life to pour life into someone else and bring them back i mean it's that sort of stuff that just i don't understand how Disney Star Wars got so lazy with some of this stuff. Next up, The Book of Boba Fett, a bizarrely superficial series about Boba Fett, where they put him on Tatooine and tell a story about him taking over for Jabba's empire, but it's only surface level, in which case they have to pad out the runtime with flashbacks of him with the Tusken Raiders, which I assumed was going to tie into the plot later on. I was like, oh, that's really cool. He's going to build all these connections here. And so when they need the Calvary to show up in the final episodes, that they'll show... Nope, that's not where it was going. Just this odd little flashback to give us a little bit of information that doesn't actually tie into the plot and all. I've made a huge mistake. And then they literally pad out the season with two episodes of The Mandalorian shoehorned in so that... And everyone says those are the two best episodes. When we stop focusing in on Boba Fett and his little adventure and instead play catch up with Mando and Grogu, everyone says those are the two best episodes. I got a bad feeling about this. That tells you every single thing you need to know about how poorly developed this show was. And I don't even understand why. It seems like they had a very shallow idea for like, yeah, what if Boba Fett took over? And then they spent absolutely no time fleshing that out, developing it. And so they just had to pad it out with all this other stuff. This show was such a huge disappointment. And truly, the only reason that any of it was actually kind of cool and enjoyable is because... For a couple episodes there, we went, hey, look, it's Mando. Hey, look, it's Luke Skywalker. Hey, look, it's Ahsoka. That's it. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. At number 11 is Attack of the Clones. And for years, I had this one at the bottom of my Star Wars ranking. But I feel now that we've had enough of Disney Star Wars, I kind of have a new appreciation for the prequels but that doesn't change the fact that this is still a deeply flawed film. There's no shortage of plot lines here, but there's not really a strong central plot line. Instead, you have an assassination plot line that you don't really care about because you know these characters aren't going to die. You have a romance that has absolutely no chemistry. You have a mystery that has absolutely no intrigue to it. Another big problem here is that the main villain of our film isn't really introduced until over an hour into the movie, and he only indirectly ties into these other plot lines so there's no kind of forward momentum there's no urgency in the plot line early on to try and stop the bad guy there's just all these kind of different things kind of happening that all come together in the final 30 minutes of the film and while we're on our little adventures it means that we spend way too much time with Anakin and Padme's romance that has some of the worst and cringiest dialogue ever put into a blockbuster. I don't like sound. Please stop it, stop it now, turn it off. It's coarse. Turn it off, stop it. Rough and irritating. Stop it, stop it, stop it. And it gets everywhere. Stop it. And when we're not doing that, then you have 
Obi-Wan hearing exposition about clones. And this is also where George Lucas just went way overboard with the CGI and green screen, where everything just looks like people standing in front of a cartoon. To its credit, there is some cool lightsaber action. There's some moments that I do enjoy, and I find this to be a lot more re-watchable than the bottom three on this list. As much as I've given this movie trouble, I still re-watch it every year with my kids. I don't really have any desire to rewatch the bottom three on this list. Real quick before I give you my top 10, be sure to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of the live action Star Wars movies and TV shows. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list and I would love to see yours. Also, if you've seen my previous rankings, you will notice that I've done a lot of reworking of my list and that's kind of as we've spent time actually processing what Disney Star Wars has given us, a lot of it has left a really sour taste in my mouth because so much of it just feels totally lifeless, like it's just a corporate product. And as flawed as George Lucas's prequels were, they felt like something that he actually poured his heart into. He needed some help, he needed some people to tell him no, but it felt like someone's true artistic expression rather than so much of what the Disney Star Wars stuff has felt like to me. And so that's why there's a pretty big change in my ranking. Kicking off our top 10, Obi-Wan Kenobi. And this was a show that I was actually very excited for. In general, I have wanted Star Wars to move away from this time period in telling stories about established characters. The one exception I've always had in mind for that was Obi-Wan Kenobi because he is this top tier character where we have this 20 year window of time where he could have been doing certain adventures trying to keep Luke safe. So as soon as they announced this, announced this show, I was actually really excited about it. And then we got it and it was so frustrating for me because there's moments that are so good. There's sequences, there's lines of dialogue that was like, man, that was cool. I love that we got to see that. I love that that was, we got a bit more of this character, a little bit more of this interaction. That was awesome. But the actual story as a whole, the actual writing as a whole, and the execution just fell so far below where this show should have been. Some things should work, but do they? Some of that is that I feel like they had three different ideas that they kind of crammed together. One of them is about Obi-Wan Kenobi processing the grief of everything that has gone down. Another one is about the Inquisitors hunting down Jedi. And then the third one is about the Reva character who's out for revenge against Anakin Skywalker. And it just kind of mashed them all together. And I felt like all of them were underdeveloped because of that. Another gigantic problem here for me is there's just so many moments of shockingly bad execution. The chase in the first episode is inexcusable while the, why this little girl is outrunning adults. Then you get to episode four, the way that Obi-Wan Kenobi escapes with Imperials everywhere is to put Leia in his oversized trench coat. <laughs> Are you serious? I mean, I just couldn't believe what I was watching at certain points in time in this show. And so for me, while it has moments that I really enjoyed, it just was spread way too thin with these plot lines, so everything felt superficial. And I know a lot of you loved this season of Kenobi, and you loved getting to see more Anakin and getting to see Darth Vader just tearing dudes up. I get all of that, and I get why that's fun to watch. But as I was watching it, along with what they did with Boba Fett, what they did with the second season of The Mandalorian, it just made me feel an awful lot like current Star Wars is influenced and inspired by previous Star Wars. So whenever they want to try and like impress us, they just show us something we've already seen. Maybe with better special effects, maybe with 21st century aesthetics, but they show us something we already know to be like, look! It's Darth Vader. Look, it's Obi-Wan. But classic Star Wars from George Lucas came from Akira Kurosawa samurai films and from Flash Gordon serials and from his study of mythology. It was all these different things combined, whereas modern Star Wars is just, let's remind you of old Star Wars. 
And that to me is so disappointing that that's what Star Wars has turned into, just nostalgia baiting. Dick, I'm very disappointed. Number nine, The Phantom Menace. Now, I've always kind of been a little bit of a defender of this movie. I think the basic structure and outline of the film is, is quite good, and it's just entirely sabotaged by a couple of total bonehead decisions. I actually made a whole video about how to fix The Phantom Menace. You can check it out right up here. But... Essentially, I think if you remove Jar Jar Binks and you make Anakin Skywalker like 16 age appropriate for Padme and not a little kid, suddenly the movie makes a lot more sense and works a lot better. Inconceivable. And a few other changes in there as well. But I think the basic idea of showing Palpatine in the background slowly manipulating different groups and factions to kind of set this whole thing in motion, I think there's some intrigue and, uh, intriguing ideas in there that really work. Darth Maul, a great villain. Not sure why they killed him off in this film, but it made for one of the great lightsaber battles in all of Star Wars having kind of this mentor figure for Obi-Wan and getting to see a young Obi-Wan kind of growing up himself into the Jedi, that's pretty cool to get to watch. So I think there's plenty of things in here that are actually quite good. Some of the execution and the way that the lightsaber battles, chases are done, very exciting stuff. There's just also a lot of politics. There's also a lot of Jar Jar stepping in poop and making Anakin a child I, makes for some just weird stuff because they're setting up a romance with a girl who's significantly older than him as well as it's just weird to put a kid in a spaceship as part of your final battle when you could just age him up to be age appropriate to be the, with the romantic character for him. And it also makes more sense for him to be racing vehicles and getting in shootouts. So I don't know why nobody stopped George from doing all of that, but I think there was potentially a much better film here than the one we got. They were so close. We were on the verge of greatness. We were this close. Then we have Solo. To me, this was a fun enough Star Wars adventure, a more simplistic story, less epic in nature, and that's kind of what I liked about it. Certainly, it has its flaws, but considering that the movie was 80% shot and then they fired the directors and brought someone new in to take over, it's remarkably coherent and totally consistent in light of all the trouble that went on with the production itself. I think the lead guy does a good job taking over for Harrison Ford. Of all the problems with this film, I don't think the change of actor is an issue at all. Um, and I think just the idea of like getting to explore the underground world of crime during the Imperial Age, that's kind of fun to get to see. There's some wacky stuff in there where Lando's droid is really into social justice. Like, it just feels very out of place in the middle of a Star Wars story to suddenly throw something like that in there. Wow, that was weird. But in general, I like having seen this and now having seen a bunch of these Disney Plus shows that we've gotten, this movie feels like this should have been a TV show. That you just have a series of these kind of adventures where you have the train heist, you have the prison break, you have the Kessel Run, and you make each of those a different episode of these kind of adventures that he had. And that feels like that fits a TV show. It's very episodic the way the movie is structured. And it doesn't need to be big, gigantic spectacle for the type of story that they're telling. So I feel like this was almost a wasted opportunity that they didn't make this a show and instead made it into a movie, in which case it's a lackluster movie. And it could have been a very cool TV show and explored this whole underground world and the mythology and all these these different factions and see the world of Star Wars from a different perspective. Number seven, The Force Awakens. This is a movie that when it first came out and up until recently, I had significantly higher up on this list, but with The Last Jedi and The Rise of Skywalker, it really soured my experience with this film. A bunch of ideas that are set up in this film that had a bunch of potential were not explored at all in the next two films. So when I rewatch this movie, I just think about all the things they could have done with what was set up here and how they didn't really do 
any of it. Now, on its own merits, J.J. Abrams is pretty good at setting up these movies that are just big, fast-moving roller coaster rides that they just start at the top of the hill and then they get going and they never really let up. There's always a chase. There's always an action sequence. There's always a joke whenever you kind of slow down for any sorts of mo moments. So they're just saturated in entertainment value. Now, of course, this movie is essentially a remake of A New Hope for a new generation. And that doesn't bother me too much. It has just enough kind of nostalgia in there while changing up a lot of the ingredients while playing catch up. That worked well enough for me. But I, as I said before, the big thing here is that I find it to be an entertaining film, but a movie that when I know they don't follow up on any of these plot lines properly, that's what just sours me on this movie. Likewise, when you realize all the wasted potential of, like, bringing the legacy characters back, but never having a reunion with Luke, Leia, and Han, that's a bizarre choice. That's so strange that they decided to do that. And when you just look back at this trilogy of films and realize all the, like, the things that would be like, yeah, of course you want to see this, you want to see this, you want to see this, that they didn't do those things. Why? 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 Why would they do this? It just... Once again, sours me on these movies as a whole, despite this one having a lot of entertainment value. Number six, The Mandalorian. And this show will probably always be a little bit special to me because it was the first TV show ever that I was excited about at the same time that my son was excited about. And so every single episode of this show has kind of been a family event for us that we watch together. That's always gonna be something special for me as a father and as a Star Wars fan that wants to pass that along to my kids. But beyond that, I just appreciated that we went to a new time period and told a story about a new character that doesn't fit neatly into our usual Star Wars formulas about the Empire, about Force users. No, he's, he's this bounty hunter that does missions and finds himself wrapped up in this adventure, and they give him this subtle, slow character arc throughout the seasons where he's this loner that lives by this creed, and then that gets all messed up when he finds this child. And all of a sudden, he sees himself in this child, and it changes him, and it challenges his values, his beliefs, his code that he lives by, and this way of life that is to find everything about him up to this point in time. I just thought it was so well done while being subtle at the same time. But that was awesome. <laughs> As you move into the second season, I felt it got a little bit too go to this place to meet the person who will tell you where you need to go next to meet the next person. And inevitably the person that they would meet would be someone from the Star Wars lore. So it was great fun to see all these characters in live action. And at the same time, it was a little bit of, um, why is every episode about going to the place to find out where the next place is? But it was still an awesome, great season in general. So for me, I thought this was a nice little addition to the world of Star Wars that found a way to kind of tie in some characters from the mythology, introducing new characters while giving us a cool character arc for Mando on this journey, all paying off with the big finale of season two where you actually get to see a Luke Skywalker in his prime. In fifth place, Revenge of the Sith. And as I mentioned earlier in here, with the release of Disney Star Wars, it's kind of given me a new appreciation for the prequels. And I'm someone that this movie came out when I was at like the peak of my cynical phase of life. And so I was not a fan of Revenge of the Sith when I saw it in the theaters. I literally laughed out loud in the theater at certain points in time because I was a very immature person at that point in time in life. And I'm still a very immature person. But as time has passed, it's a movie that I appreciate a lot more and can see all the great things in it. The sequence when Order 66 goes down, it's the most gut-wrenching and emotional sequence in all of the Star Wars saga. The battle between Obi-Wan and Anakin. It's epic. It's awesome. And as much as people are like, oh, it feels overly choreographed. Right, because they're Force users that can kind of sense what the other person is about to do at the top of their game. Yeah, of course it's going to be very 
choreographed and danced like, that's not a bad thing. That fits with the actual abilities of force users involved in an epic conflict with someone that they know very, very well. And just in general, this is the movie where you actually got to see the Clone Wars and the scope and size of what was taking place at this era and Palpatine's kind of scheme all coming together with his rise to power and the birth of the Empire. I guess I've said before, I have some issues with the exact way that they motivate Anakin's turn to the dark side. I think there's some big gaps in there where in a span of 13 minutes, he goes from, I better go tell Mace Windu to, I better kill these kids. That's a pretty big jump. And the rationale they give me isn't quite there. It's somewhat informed better by the Clone Wars that kind of in makes some things make a bit more sense. But I think that could have been better. So that's why this isn't really a top tier Star Wars film for me. But it is a very good Star Wars film. And it's one that I think has aged quite well, especially for someone like me that saw it a very cynical time in my life. So was not a big fan of it back in the day. Much more so now, I appreciate its merit. In fourth place, Rogue One. And for me, this is the piece of Disney Star Wars that has aged the best. Even as much as I raved about The Mandalorian just a few moments ago, season two does a lot of the member berries with, look who it is, remember this person? To try and elevate fairly simplistic and sometimes repetitive plot lines. Oops! And with Rogue One, I feel like this is a fresh piece of Star Wars that's different. It takes place right before A New Hope, but it's a very different story from A New Hope with a very different set of characters that plays out very differently as it's a tragedy. Every character in this movie dies. Everyone we get attached to gets blown to pieces by the end of the film. And that's what I appreciate about it. It's a film that wasn't afraid to kill off the entire cast. It puts the war into Star Wars. It has actual stakes and consequences. In order for us to get these plans, in order for us to set up a new hope, there are costs that come with that. And so you get this very serious story that's not just a bunch of superficial jokes. It's not just a roller coaster ride. It is a story that takes war seriously. And that's why I think it's just has aged really well. It's not playing to the lowest common denominator. It's not going for the broadest audience. It's not just a series of nonstop cameos. So when you do the one little bit, the couple of scenes with Vader, they really pop and they're very cool and they make sense in the context of this story, but they feel earned at the same time. Speaking of that Vader scene, that hallway one was the Vader that we'd been waiting to see for a long time, where you get 21st century visual effects with a Vader in his prime just tearing dudes to pieces. It was cool to get to see that. So for me, this of the Disney Star Wars era is the one that I think works the best and has aged the best. And in particular, that's kind of impressive because this is another movie that had a very troubled production that was radically reworked after principal photography. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comments section. My list isn't the right list, it's just my list. And I would love it if you would share yours down below. Also, I've done a bunch of other Star Wars videos and Star Wars rankings. You can check them out in this playlist when this video is over. In third place, Return of the Jedi. And this is easily the most simplistic on a plot level of the original trilogy, but I think it's also so satisfying on an emotional level where they bring Luke Skywalker on this full journey where he has to face off against his father and throughout the course of what takes place in that throne room, Luke, through his hope, his optimism, is able to actually bring back Anakin from the dark side and allow Anakin to be a piece of of the destruction of Palpatine and the bringing down of the Empire. Also along the way, I think the space battle in this movie is the best space battle ever put on film. Outstanding. From the way it's shot to the model work, all of it, this is the best looking, this is the best stage space battle, I think in all of cinema, 
Maybe that's because it's the one I grew up with that defined my criteria by which I evaluate space battles, but I love the look, the feel, everything of this space battle. Now, this movie gets picked on a little bit because of the Ewoks, and perhaps because of my age, they've just never bothered me, and I was born in the early 80s, so the Ewoks were put in there to appeal to young people like me in the 80s, so perhaps it worked, I guess, but it's also a pretty classic movie formula. The go primitive plot line where the primitive locals take on the more advanced, civilized, larger army. It's the plot line of Pocahontas, Dances with Wolves, Last Samurai, Avatar, and before all of that, Return of the Jedi did it. And so it's never really bothered me because that's sometimes the way that plots work. When you put it all together, on a story level, yeah, it's more basic, but it delivers more action, bigger action, and most importantly, lots of emotion and a satisfying conclusion to this trilogy of films. Our runner-up, Star Wars, the movie that basically invented the term blockbuster and turned cinema on its head. George Lucas pulled from everything that he loved, from fantasy to samurai films to Flash Gordon to mythology, and he blended them all together, and he wrote this weird script that all of his friends said, that's a little bit too weird, and he kept reworking it and reworking it until he made a way to communicate timeless mythology, combine all these genres in a way that was mainstream and has been beloved for now 45 years by multiple different generations. You did it! Congratulations! The movie's jam-packed with great, memorable characters that obviously we're still making movies about these characters to this day. When Luke Skywalker shows up in an episode of The Mandalorian, we all lose our minds. We just got a show about Obi-Wan when he was just a few years, well, I guess 10 years before he was in this movie. Why? Because George Lucas came up with a great set of characters, a great mythology, a great adventure that just touches something that crosses cultural boundaries, crosses time, and it, all of it started right here with this adventure and even to an extent, um, just this last month, Top Gun Maverick came out, and one of the things that people have been joking about is that Top Gun Maverick rips off the third act of this movie about having to shoot down an exhaust pipe. It's pretty overtly, blatantly pulled straight out of A New Hope, because when you want to make a great, feel-good story, what do you do? You tell something like this. It's a movie that was, it changed how movies were made. Introduced us to this world. It was just such a great film. But coming in in first place is The Empire Strikes Back. A movie that takes everything that worked about the original film and takes it to the next level. It focuses more on the characters. So you get a coming of age story with Luke as he goes off to Dagobah and is trained to be a Jedi, and he's truly challenged and tested for the first time, and he fails his test. With Han and Leia, Han continues his adventure of or journey of trying to become the good guy while being haunted by his past that eventually catches up with him while falling in love with Princess Leia. We get a great new set of characters thrown into the mix, of course, with Yoda, of course, with Lando, and you get one of the great twists in all of film history. Other thing in here, you could have said this with all these movies, but the score is phenomenal. I feel like this is the best of the Star Wars scores. I love the Yoda music. I love just how rousing the score can be when the Millennium Falcon is flying through the asteroid field. The uh, Imperial March was introduced in this film. And this is where you really get Vader kind of becoming front and center, a part of the story. At the end of the movie, the good guys lose, the bad guys win, and we don't know what's going to happen next. It's a movie where act actions, choices matter, and as uplifting as the original ending was of the original Star Wars, this one is just as satisfying, 
but it's a bittersweet type of conclusion to a film. So it takes everything to the next level, has more emotions, more spectacle. It's a great sequel. It's one of the great movies of all time. So it comes in at number one. If you enjoy this video, I've got more Star Wars content. You can check it out right over there. If you want to keep your online life secure, remember to check out NordVPN at the link down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies too much. Bye-bye.